Hey, YouTube. Hopefully you're both hearing me all right. Eric Byler for the Young Turks. We are at day two of the fifth and final meeting of the Democratic Party's Unity Reform Commission. I'm going to have uh, Laura Barone Lopez of the Washington Examiner join me uh, to kind of summarize what happened yesterday. And then I'm going to go over there and share this to TYT Politics. So would you mind holding the mic? And I'll, yeah. I'll be right back. OK, come on. Okay. Tell us about yesterday. Okay. Hi, I'm Laura Brown Lopez with The Examiner. So yesterday was the first meeting of the Unity Reform Commission. The commission was created at the 2016 Democratic Convention in order to bridge the gap between the Sanders and Clinton wings of the party. And um, so this is their final meeting. Their fir the first day of the meeting was yesterday. Uh, today is the last day. And at this meeting, at the end of it, they're supposed to be uh, finalizing their proposal for reforms that they are going to present to the entire DNC. And those reforms range from uh, reducing superdelegates, the power of superdelegates, to opening up primaries and possibly opening up caucuses. And so yesterday they decided to reduce, to put in the re proposal uh, a reduction of superdelegates. So the what they ended up deciding on was that uh, DNC members uh, would not have superdelegate powers anymore. So the people that maintain their superdelegate powers are going to be governors, um, former presidents, uh, elected House members, and elected senators. They get to keep their superdelegate powers, but um, DNC members won't be able to. Their, their vote during the convention, during the presidential primary, will have to be bound to whatever the outcome of their state's was so that was that's going to be put into the proposal they voted on that yesterday and then they uh it looks as though they are going to try and open up primaries and then today they're going to be talking about whether or not they want to open up caucuses to people who physically cannot be present uh, and they also are going to be talking more about budget transparency yesterday the most heated debate was around uh the fact that DNC members and people even on the executive committee of the DNC cannot see or have access to the budget. Um, and when Chairman Perez was asked uh, why that was so, he said, well, there are FEC filing reports and, and people can you know, see where the money is going in and out of the DNC there but that actually FEC filing reports don't contain everything. And so what DNC members want to know is what money is being spent on consultants and what money is being spent on vendors and uh, whether or not they can scale that back or if these vendors and consultants are even effective. And that's a big uh, point of contention among members. So. All right, thank you for that. So if you're watching on Facebook, you have an angle that uh, has a little bit better view of Jeff Weaver, uh, Bernie Sanders' former campaign manager. If you're watching on YouTube, your angle will help you see Nina Turner and our own Nomiki Konst on this side of the table. I'll probably be operating the YouTube um, more to pan back and forth, and Facebook, you'll be stuck. And if you don't like, like being stuck uh, with one, one shot, go to youtube.com slash tytpolitics. Okay, so yesterday um, there was discussion of uh, whether or not people who are not Democrats can vote in the Democratic primary. And it was pretty clear that the, the Bernie, Sanders, Bernie Sanders Our Revolution contingent would have liked to have seen a change that opens the primaries or actually uses whatever power the Democratic Party has over the states to say, we want you to open those primaries. That got voted down, is that correct? Um, so I'm pretty positive that that did get voted down. And the main argument was that... Um, well, if you're going to vote in a Democratic Party, um, then you should be a Democrat. Um, uh, like you said, the Bernie Sanders wing says that, well, you know, this last election cycle, we saw so many people who wanted to get involved that never did before. Mm -hmm. You know, Bernie did bring uh, independents into the fold and brought people that wouldn't have necessarily wanted to have voted uh, in the Democratic primary before. And so they're arguing that if we want to be the big tent that the Democrat Democratic Party always says that it is, then we should open up the primaries and also make sure that 
um, you know, you don't have to be a registered Democrat so far out. Certain, you know, yeah. New York is the example, but um, that months out, you have to be a registered Democrat. Um, and so they'd like to see more same day registration when it comes to that. And it sounded like, you no, know, mind you, these are recommendations that are made to the bylaws and rules committee, which then makes recommendations to the larger DNC. So um, this is important, but it's not the end game. And it sounded like what they're, they're going to put in this language is that they want same-day registration, which is a brilliant idea. Uh, young people who are aging into the electoral uh, process are going to be more likely to go out and register and vote on the same day rather than having to do two different uh, processes. Uh, and I saw it my, myself in Wisconsin at Marquette University. They were lined up all around in a maze around the student center at Marquette University. Um, to register and uh, to vote. So it's a, it's a good idea for the Democratic Party to bring in those new voters, those immigrants and those young people with the same day registration. And I think what the Bernie Sanders contingent was saying is if we're gonna let them register on the, actually, no, this was coming from the establishment side. If we're gonna let them register as Democrats on the day of, then um, why can't we just ask them to do that? Um, they'll be they can be independents before, they can be unregistered before, but if they register on the day of as Democrats, that's all we're asking in order to vote in the Democratic primary. Do you think that's a sound argument? I mean, <laughs> it's not necessarily for me to say whether it's sound or not. Uh, it's something that, you know, after the 2016 election, we, we s Democrats expected to win that election. Um, it didn't go any way that they thought it would. And so I think that some of the arguments that you're hearing from the Sanders more progressive wing of the party is that look like if, if there's any time to change the way we've been doing things it should be right now mm -hmm. because we expected to win that election uh, everyone was caught by surprise and we're facing a very different political future than anyone was anticipating before mm -hmm. and so uh, that's why they're really trying to reform the party and the way it operates uh, to make sure that all the things that happened in 2016 don't happen again well, I was telling Ryan that I would have liked to have been able to vote in the last primary, but I, no, it was a closed primary in D.C. and I wasn't able to as an independent, and that I would, I would be more interested in this kind of inner workings of the DNC if I felt more included. So, I mean, that's a point there. Um, he explained to me, this was in the cab ride on the way home, that the concern that more establishment Democrats have is that Trump may not have a, an opponent. Let's say he survives till 2020. He may not have a primary opponent whereas the Democrats, it's gonna be a broad you know, field of candidates. And their concern is, is that people like Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity will tell Republican voters, well, it's an open primary, so go and vote for this candidate. That will help us uh, in the general. And I remember that happened in Virginia. I was living in Virginia in 2008. Rush Limbaugh told all the Republicans to go vote in the Democratic primary. I think uh, Obama was leading by that point, so he actually was telling his listeners to vote for Hillary Clinton to prolong the, the, the brawl. Um, so I know you don't like to give your uh, opinion on these things, but what do you think the chances are that that kind of thing could actually impact a presidential race? And have you, have, are there any examples you can think of that actually working in the past? Um, I don't know if I think that it would actually impact significantly a presidential race, um, but we have seen even some examples that popped up in uh, in the uh, Alabama Senate race right now with Roy Moore. So one of his spokes uh, women, she and apologies, YouTube viewers, um, go over to Facebook.com/slash The Young Turks or facebook.com slash TYT politics uh, where we've shared it over to and uh, you can see the uh, conversation I just had with Laura Barone Lopez of the Washington Examiner um, she was here all day yesterday um, and you, you might have time to get most of that watched before they actually start here on YouTube um, but yeah if you want to have two angles uh, keep them both open um, should be the same sound feed. And um, one of the angles sort of favors the uh, camera right side of the room. That would be the Facebook angle. Um, and on that side, you would see um, Jeff Weaver, campaign manager for uh, Bernie Sanders. Um, 
and others, but I can't remember the names right now. And then uh, on the other side, uh, you got uh, Nina Turner. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see Nina, Nina Turner a little better. Um, and our own Namiki Konst. So it was supposed to start at 9. Nobody believed that, because yesterday they were an hour and 15 minutes late. Uh, today it's 10.46, so they're an hour and 46 minutes late thus far. So if you want some background on this commission, uh, they decided to have it during if the... If the commission members can take their seats, please. Okay, here we go. During the uh, Democratic National Convention last year, they decided to do this. Uh, the delegates are chosen by the Hillary Clinton camp, the Bernie Sanders camp, and the chair of the DNC, which is... Um, uh, w well, now I can't remember his name right now. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it... It, it's sort of like um, in Congress when you have committees and the party that, that uh, controls the House is going to have more votes on those committees, and that's kind of what's going on here. The establishment has more votes on this, on this committee. Um, the Our Revolution Bernie Sanders wing is kind of like the minority, um, and they, you know, they use this. They've had five meetings like this. This is the last day of the fifth meeting. They use this opportunity to make their case for how um, we should make changes that are more inclusive of sort of grassroots momentum that may arise from the candidacies of candidates like Bernie Sanders. Um, and uh, ultimately, uh, the establishment votes kind of have the ability to say yes or no to that. At least that's the observation that, that I've made. Um, and also keep in mind that this then goes to the Rules and Bylaws Committee of the Democratic Party, which will um, take this into consideration and then make further recommendations to the broader DNC. And I'm going to ask about this, but it would be my guess that as you get higher up into the uh, power echelons that the Our Revolution Bernie Sanders side of the debate will probably has less power um, in each at each stage. But this is important. Um, this is an open meeting. There are uh, members of the public here. There are uh, the authors of the Democratic Autopsy are here. Um, minor disruption yesterday uh, when they tried to hold up signs that said Democratic or Undemocratic Party. And it looks like looks like we're almost going to begin. Okay, so this is one of the people who's from the um, from the Democratic Autopsy contingent. I attended a press conference with her yesterday. She's uh, voicing her grievances. Let's see if I can plug in another mic and get some sound for you. So one of her complaints is that when people registered for the meeting, they didn't receive word about where it was going to be. I can tell you that was not true for members of the press. We got instructions on where to turn up. OK, that's when I registered. So she says they didn't hear it till 48 hours before. members 
I am a party officer. I am an executive board rep of my own state party. And I would hope that we could share this in a collegial manner. Thank you so much for your thoughts. We have that and we're scanning it and emailing it around to all the commission members. Thanks so much. Thank Appreciate it. Yeah, and all the other materials that we receive will be scanned uh, as well as we've done in every other meeting. If there were a, what, it's, there was an opportunity for public comment. They, there's no reason why they can't be handed out. Everyone should get them. So it's not a problem. It would have been. I appreciate it. We just had a miscommunication. Chaotic. We're handing them out, and thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. With That's us. what we they do at that. town okay, council meetings. Have, uh, the commission at their seat. Citizens' time Please. at the beginning. Maybe that'll be a reform for next time. If you could just hand them to Maureen, can you take those documents right there, staff, and just hand them over, hand them out to the commission members? Thank you. <clears throat> can the commission members take their seats so we can get started, please? Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Jen O'Malley Dillon. Uh, I am the chair of the Unity Reform Commission, and I am joined by my friend, Vice Chair Larry Cohen, and I hereby call the final Unity Reform Commission uh, to order. I ask the members to stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you. I am now going to ask Patrice Taylor. I am now going to ask Helen McFadden to call the roll. Okay, thanks. And uh, let me say to all um, 21 of us and those who are here from the public, uh, we set off on this journey formally in May. Uh, we came here from three different, three different nominees. Uh, makes this a struggle because if everybody came exactly, if everybody participates exactly where they came from, doesn't take a math genius to figure out the solution or the outcome. It's not a solution. So, particularly because of where we came from, lots was accomplished uh, yesterday. There were three main areas, unpledged delegates, primaries, and party reform. 
And today, the fourth area, caucuses, and we will be going back to some unfinished business in those three. But what are the big items that lift up from it? It's never been about perfection, but what I'd call large steps, if not giant steps, in terms of voters first. Voters first in terms of eliminating uh, 400 superdelegates out of 715 on the first ballot for the president, presidential nomination of the United States. Voters first in saying loud and clear that in primaries, this party stands behind same-day registration, automatic voter registration, same-day party registration, that this party stands behind a process in every state in terms of the election of the leadership of the Democratic Party that is transparent, that is open, that is clear, that is as simple as possible so that activists can get involved in the party and run and not feel like they have no chance. And that for those of us who are here, Sister Bernard, Bernal, who spoke earlier, I don't know if she's still here, and others. This will be about what we do in the states, not just what we do here or what the DNC does at every level. It's not going to be about 447 people. It's going to be about millions of people and how they take up this challenge and this path. So I am proud to say that I've worked with this chair, appointed by Hillary Clinton, myself appointed by Bernie Sanders, that in the year we have worked together, since the four forums that were open to the public, not just open, but participation, that in that year, we found lots of common ground, and not just based on where are the numbers on this commission. As I said yesterday, we're governed by that resolution that had lots of specifics in it, including the makeup here. No one was under any illusions when we agreed to put in, for most of us here, hundreds of hours. We're all volunteers, just like the activists that are sitting here and watching. No difference. And so today, as we conclude, I say this to all of us, because we may not meet together again as 21, and we're 20 today. We should take it as a lesson that we don't have to just do what we were told to do. We don't have to just look at the rearview mirror and figure out that's what we're doing going forward, exactly what we did in the past. That we actually can, more or less, with that resolution, as boundaries, it's definitely boundaries, start with a blank sheet of paper, what's good for the people, what's good for working families, what's good for this party, if the party not only wants to win but clearly stand for something that we can all be proud of. And I would say to you, not rehearsed, not perfect, that I'm proud to have been your vice chair and to have worked with you. And I hope that today we can finish in that spirit. Thank you, Larry. All right, well, we are um, ready to get to business. We still have some work before us, uh, important work. So we are gonna start this morning reviewing caucuses. Uh, they, we will then move to amendments that were tabled yesterday uh, we will then move to the process uh, and next steps, and we will then um, have hear from the commission members. Mm -hmm. So let's begin going through the caucuses uh, and the recommendations that are before us. I will give a uh, summary of what we have, <coughs> and then we will open for amendments from uh, the commission members. So the commission has been mandated to make recommendations to the caucuses, um, focusing on making them less burdensome and more inclusive transparent and accessible to participants. We have over the course of the last um, number of months heard from 
a lot of different uh, people about caucuses, everything <laughs> from certainly uh, the very uh, unique perspective of those on the commission who either have been part of caucuses or execute them, as well as from state parties in a number of large and small states. Um, we have done a, real, a lot of work here and a lot of thinking, and so the recommendations that I'm about to go through come from that work we've done over the last year. So the key highlights that are currently in the recommendations around caucuses include the following. Requiring absentee voting, uh, having, making sure state parties have the financial and technical ability to run and execute the caucus, <coughs> requiring same-day voter registration and party affiliation, a change at the caucus location, requiring public reporting of the total statewide <laughs> vote count, um, making sure votes are cast uh, in writing, provide for a recount uh, or re-canvas, re uh, lock the allocation of delegates on the initial round of voting, limit the impact of any voter suppression or disenfranchisement imposed by the state, uh, when a state has uh, five or more congressional districts and holds a state-run primary, the state party <coughs> should use this primary to allocate delegates to presidential candidates. The DNC should institute a national training program specific to caucuses. The DNC should work with state parties to create standards, guidelines uh, for information dissemination and reporting, as well as supporting some of the new uh, guidelines provided by um, these caucus recommendations, uh, and then <clears throat> at the end of the day, we should ensure that all caucus voters have the right to participate. So those are the, just the highest level. Um, with that, I open it up to the commission for amendments on the caucus section. Jeff Weaver. <laughs> I had an amendment that I timely filed, which I don't think should be controversial, although you never know, uh, with respect to 1D in the text. So, you know, for the first time, we are requiring caucuses to provide statewide headcounts. Um, uh, and for those of you, I know many on this commission are familiar with how the Iowa caucus and other caucuses work, but even on caucus night, they are an iterative process. Generally speaking, there is an initial count of people in the room, and then there is a process which we call realignment, where uh, supporters of non-viable candidates then uh, uh, move to other candidates who are viable, and in some cases even supporters of viable candidates can move around the room. Um, but we, in making sure that we do these statewide uh, uh, head counts, we want to make sure that we capture the first expression uh, of, uh, voter, of voter sentiment for the candidates. Because in, in uh, the caucus process, often if, if you, what is expressed at the end of the night is the number of delegates that people won, and that understates the support that uh, uh, le lesser performing candidates have received. So in the Iowa caucus, for instance, you could receive 14% of the vote in every precinct in the state, uh, and your election return would be counted, would be reported as zero on caucus night. Uh, and I think that that's unfair, particularly when we're looking at 2020, where we're gonna have a crowded field. There are gonna be a lot of candidates who are going to be introducing themselves for the first time uh, to voters in Iowa and to the nation. Uh, I think it is important, uh, given Iowa's first in the nation status, uh, that voters in subsequent states know that candidate X got really got 13% of the vote in Iowa and not 0%. Uh, certainly this impacted Governor O'Malley's campaign in 2016, uh, where you know his election night uh, report of state delegate equivalents was far below what I believe was his uh, per overall percentage of the vote of the people coming to the caucus. So I would replace the language in D, which currently says require the public reporting of the total statewide vote counts for each candidate based on the first round of voting, which is a term we use uh, elsewhere in here with a different meaning, frankly, uh, to with this language, which says requires the public reporting of the statewide vote counts for each candidate based on the first expression of preference by caucus participants. So when you do the first division when the people go in and get into their various groups. I know in Iowa what they do is they then count people and put those numbers onto a mass sheet uh, to determine viability. It is those numbers that would be used uh, for reporting uh, the statewide vote total. 
Uh, so I, I think it's comfortable with the way that Iowa and other states already do it. It's not uh, particularly burdensome, doesn't require them to do any extra steps. It just ensures that, it, in fact, numbers that they're already collecting in the first instances are the, instance are the ones that are used uh, for these statewide vote totals so that voters know when voters came to the caucus who they supported in, when they first got there before the realignment process. In terms of the delegate allocation, they can, do what they, they can continue doing it the way they currently do it. Thanks, Jeff. Jeff Berman. Oh, thank you. Second. Okay. Berman. Yeah, I, I have a question as to how that might or might not square with the notion of having a written record of each vote and for the availability of a recount. Um, because if there is a realignment uh, so that the votes that are actually used to uh, mathematically compute the delegates would not necessarily be the same as the votes that would be cast at the first expression that Jeff is talking about. So you actually might have a uh, sort of an inconsistency then between the recount method and uh, whatever it is that you're reporting. Uh, and you might want to still have the flexibility to report the first tier votes as, uh, as completed and that would be the record and then that would be available for the recount and you would use that information to confirm the delegate allocations were correct. Yeah, I, I mean, as much as possible, you know, we would like to leave the, the actual implementation of the policies to the states themselves who are running these caucuses. I think the only principle here that we are trying to protect is that voters know in the first instance when people came in who voted for whom or who was supporting whom when they walked through the door prior to the realignment. So, you know, whether Iowa collects writing at that point or collects it later, I, I think is something that can be left to them. I mean, the, the recount for purposes of the popular vote is really not, I mean, people are not going to have a recount for a popular vote that doesn't result in any delegate allocation. I mean, no one's going to say, I want a recount of the first impression. So, I mean, the reality is, in the instance of a state that is tracking their first vote and then will have a realignment, and that a realignment, wherever they end up, those that next set of votes would determine delegate allocation, it probably makes sense for that state in that instance to be tracking both counts for purposes of a recount. It's confusing to have two sets of votes, but well, by doing it this way and having realignment, you're, you're going to be have, in that situation exactly, anyway. Exactly. You're going to have two sets of popular votes plus a delegate count. So you're going to have three sources of information as to what happened. Not even two, but three in that case. Uh, you know, I know Iowa has traditionally had one. And so now we would write, which is the state delegate equivalent. So now we would be going from one, not just from one to two, but from one to two to three, potentially. Jeff? But I, but I think by saying it's the first expression, we're taking out the third one that you're talking about. Okay, we're going to go to Jan, and then we're going to go to Mayor Webb. Yeah, and I'm speaking Jeff Berman as opposed to Jeff Weaver. Uh, we've been talking about ways to track the different levels of the alignment process already uh, as a result of... Uh, the ongoing uh, review we've been having in Iowa, and we're talking about methods and how we could best track those levels of alignment, because we do. We, we're going to have to have an audit process, and uh, we want to make sure that it's fair uh, to all to all candidates. Mayor Webb, you anticipated to have my question because I wanted to know what Jan's position was, given she's from the state of Iowa as well as Jane from the state of Nebraska, who are both smaller states who uh, rely heavily on caucuses. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Mayor. Um, while we, uh, in the past, we've got a tradition of reporting delegate numbers, um, we, we were preparing for the uh, possibility of having to uh, provide the, the audit numbers because we want to make sure this is fair to all. Yeah, an improved process is, is a better uh, caucus for all of us. 
And so, um, while we prefer to do the, the count based on, on delegates, uh, that's a true, uh, the result of a true caucus, uh, we can deal with whatever the, the commission uh, decides upon. We're flexible and we're open to any suggestions and, and want to make sure this is the best process uh, for, for the candidates in the Democratic Party. Jane. Yeah, and in the state of Nebraska, we um, have caucus goers write down their preference, and so it's already written on a piece of paper that is then recorded and kept. Um, so this, we would be able to abide by this with no changes. And one other thing I just want to make a note of, um, further down in the recommendations in this section, it does have um, uh, uh, mostly a number five, but it, it highlights that the DNC will work with the state parties to create consistent standards and guidelines across caucuses, um, that the DNC should explore technology resources available to support state parties in creating a tracking and reporting system that states can use to streamline registration and reporting. I bring that up to say that this, in my mind, captures the fact that we acknowledge these recommendations are making one changes and two making it a little bit more complicated and that uh, we recommend that the, the national party is supporting that, whether it's from just coming up with a system that works for folks in conjunction with the states that have caucuses to you know, maybe even helping with the technology side of the actual tracking. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that since I think it's complementary to the point that you're bringing up, Jeff. Any additional discussion on this? I'd move the question. Okay. Uh, all right, we're going to go to a vote on the amendment 4D, which changes round of voting to expression of preference by caucus participants. First expression. Oh, right. For, well, first is in there, so it's right. it's not being switched. Thank you very much, Jeff. <laughs> um, okay, so all those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. It's unanimous. Yep, we are unanimous. The amendment passes. Thank you. Uh, okay, we're going to move to any additional amendments on caucuses before us. Yes, I have an amendment. Um, amendment number 34. Um, it changes uh, page 20, lines 12 and 13. Uh, the mandate currently require, uh, asks us to make recommendations on expanding the use of primaries, and this is what my amendment does. Uh, currently, the language reads, in states with five or more congressional districts that hold a state-run Democratic presidential primary, there should be presumption that the state's delegate selection plan used the outcome of primaries to allocate delegates for the respective presidential candidates rather than a caucus. Um, my, my amendment simply removes the exception and begins with, uh, there shall be a presumption that state's delegate selection plans use the outcome of the state-run presidential primaries to allocate delegates for their respective presidential candidates rather than a caucus. Um, my amendment does not require states that do not have uh, primaries to hold primaries. It simply says that states that already have both a state-sponsored primary and a caucus, that they use the state primary um, to allocate their delegates. Um, right now, in 2000, well, in 2016, there were only two states that have both state-run primaries and used their caucuses instead to allocate delegates. That was Nebraska and Washington State. Um, the exception carved out something for Nebraska. My problem with that was that in, the, uh, in Nebraska in 2016, only 22,000 people participate in the caucuses, despite campaigns spending hundreds, um, if not millions of dollars to turn out votes in the Nebraska caucuses. Um, and in the state-run primaries, it was only uh, uh, where no money was spent in organizing anything, 80,000 participants participate in it. So that's almost four times the amount. And I think if we're looking to include more people in the process, that we have to um, use primaries over caucuses. Um, and that is my amendment. 
happy to hear any Do questions. Do we have a second? That's David Hyun of Louisiana. Okay, Larry. Yeah, so somewhat emotional about this. I apologize in advance. <clears throat> I read from the ACLU report on Nebraska. Nebraska. Larry <coughs> Cohen, Vice Chair, Larry Cohen. Uh, Nebraska, uh, I'm going to be parenthetical. In Nebraska, attacks on voting rights happen year after year. Nebraska is a solidly red state. They have voter suppression. They have voter suppression year after year after year. Many of us here, not only me, many can get ahead of me in terms of a lifetime voting for, fighting for voting rights. The whole premise for these red states, one of the reasons why many of us are so passionate about letting the state decide whether they have a caucus or not, is the absolute trashing of voting rights. That's what has occurred in every one of those states. That's why we lose these elections. And for us to now say that we're going to strip Nebraska of the caucus for some reason that I don't even understand, when they have to fight that year after year, as you can tell, I'm quite upset and quite passionate about defending the right of the people in Nebraska to decide that issue, not this commission. Emmy? Hi, hi, Larry. I have um, a similar but opposite concern. I think in Washington State, when we saw when we heard the presentation, I don't remember the exact figures, so I should please don't quote me on this. But it was about one third of the total number of voters that voted in the primary caucus, not the same people, but the quantity. And those hundreds of thousands of voters that voted in the Washington primary literally had no voice. They were not able to run for delegates. They, their vote went uncounted, right. completely Emmy, uncounted. Emmy and I think Ruiz that's problematic Texas. too. And so, uh, hold on. Right, I agree. Yeah, I mean, it had, no, but it had higher representation. So what I'm saying, you're saying that you know people are disenfranchised. To me, this is another way of how they've been disenfranchised, because hundreds of thousands. No, you're looking at Nebraska, but I'm looking at Washington. So that's what I'm saying. Emmy has the floor. It, you know, a coin on different sides. It's still disenfranchisement. And so I think that when created the opportunity, it is important that we also take a lump sum of how we can engage and franchise people and ensure that it's helping party building. And so I also think I don't, I certainly don't want to get into this, but I think that we all can agree that the caucuses can also feel disenfranchising at times because they're not accessible always to communities of color, uh, to those with disabilities, to those who <coughs> might have to work, et cetera. And so, you know, I think with this, Dave, I'll be voting in support of you. I, the Washington story really stuck out to me in terms of the hundreds of thousands of Washingtonians who participated in the primary and their votes were not counted. Uh, and many more participated in the primary than they did in the caucus. Okay, Nomi. I just have a couple questions for, for those in the room who are, come from caucus states. Um, and maybe, maybe Jeff can explain this as well because I've heard you talk about, the, Jeff Weaver, excuse me, uh, or Berman, you know, either one. Uh, I, am I correct to say that every single district in a caucus state must be represented? So if there's, you know, a district that would be primarily a community of color, they would be represented? No, Mickey Const of New York. I believe we heard this in a testimony. I mean, that's that's what I'm bringing well, up. Well, I mean, you know, the, the precincts are geographically organized in a caucus, and so if you have communities of color, they tend to be they, there tend to be precincts that are um, uh, dominated by people of color in the, just because of the way the precincts are done geographically. So, so there's representation. It's not like you know they're leaving out an entire community. And I mean, based on what Emmy is saying, I, it just it did, it didn't make sense to me that there's some communities that are not represented. Um, the other question I have is, why would we throw the baby out with the bathwater? Just because Washington has a system which, by the way, we are addressing with our previous amendment in reforming the caucuses. Why would we throw out a system for every other state just because Washington, which we've recommended, reform its system? Or whoever. I mean, I'm just asking a question. Emmy or, or David? Well, I, 
just just to respond quickly, I think the reason why is the numbers that we saw in 2016, 80,000 people voted in the primary and 20,000 people voted in the Nebraska caucuses. And I'm saying that if we want more people involved in the process, then let's use the process that includes the most amount of people, that have enfranchised the most amount, amount of people. David Hewn of Louisiana. Jane. So obviously a couple of things since this is directed at the state that I'm the party chair of. Um, there could be clear unintended consequences by your amendment and the caucus working group worked very hard across both wings of our party to put forward to this commission very reasonable and strong recommendations to reform the caucus process to make them more fair and transparent, and to also allow states the right to choose to caucus if that state central committee body choose to go in that direction. I think it is inappropriate, David, for you to tell Nebraska what type of choice we should be making. We have smart and intelligent people on the state central committee who are currently d debating and deliberating this issue right now. The individual who created our caucus system, her name is Charlene Butts. She's an African-American woman. She's a veteran. Her mother is Evelyn Butts, who if you know your history in Virginia, the reason we don't have a poll tax is because of her. She's the first person to tell you that she wants to make sure that our caucuses are transparent and accessible. My task as a party chair is to build our party. Caucuses are very empowering for individuals when they are run properly. The only reason I have a diverse grassroots state central committee is because they rose through the caucus system. There are problems with the caucus system. We acknowledge that. But it is not our role as a unity commission to tell a state that they have to choose one or the other. David, I'm not finished. I not say anything. Uh, Jane Klebe of Nebraska. And so I'm asking my fellow Unity Commission members to vote down this amendment. There are already very strong conditions in here to reform caucuses. Many states are already choosing on their right, in their process, to move from a caucus to a primary because of some of the obstacles caucuses put up. But the big unintended consequence that you could put forward with this type of amendment is in a GOP-led Iowa, they could decide that they're moving to a primary. And then that would wipe out Iowa's caucus with your amendment. And I think we, as the Democratic Party, it's the one time that a rural state actually has a platform in our party is the Iowa caucus. And I will never allow the Iowa caucus system to be dismantled. She said my name, so I should be able to respond. There's a cue here. You're right, yeah. though. Your na her, his she name was called, so name. you can respond to what she said. To be very clear here, the, the current language already requires state, a state to do something that they did not choose to do. So I'm simply taking out the exception from Nebraska. Um, is all I am doing. And then also to clarify, this has no impact against Iowa or Nevada or any other caucus state that does not have a state-run primary. It only affects states that have state-run primaries. And right now, the only two states that have state-run primaries and caucuses is Nebraska and Washington State. The current language already requires Washington State to switch from a caucus to a primary. Right now, simply, there is an exception for Nebraska, and I think it's unfair to have an exception for just one state. So, David, to be uh, clear, unintended consequences, Iowa next legislative session could move to a primary. You wipe out the Iowa caucus with this. Right, for clarification, this would, this would be moving forward. So anything that was adjusted, while this might be the case for just Nebraska right now, it would be the case for other states that could end up in this situation, and certainly the Iowa example is true. We have a line here, so it's Larry, uh, Jan, and then Jeff Weaver, Emmy, and Mayor. Yeah, just um, more calmly, 
Um, what we're saying here in the caucus language is that caucuses must have same-day registration. Caucuses must have same-day party registration. Caucuses must have absentee voting. Caucuses will only, caucuses where there are primaries will only exist in states with five or more, will not exist, sorry, in states with five or more congressional districts. We've already taken care of the Washington issue. This is the Democratic Party. This is the Democratic Party. We're trying to say that for Democrats who are struggling in these states, because the caucuses that are left will all be states like Nebraska, states like Utah, states where being a Democrat is almost an act of courage, and that those states will have to have rules that make it easy and inclusive for people to join the Democratic Party, which is a way to change the situation in those states. Nebraska is not a blank sheet of paper. Nebraska has one of the worst governors in the country. If not, you know, it's hard to compare some of them. And that's what we're dealing with here. We're not dealing in the abstract. We're dealing with the concrete. And that's what they face. That's what Jane Klebb faces in Nebraska. That's what John Bauer faces right now in Iowa. And so that's what we're doing here. And we're taking care already of Washington and, and Colorado and Minnesota took care of themselves. So let's just be clear. We are saying that to run a caucus, all caucuses, and they're all now in smaller states until Washington, and we're encouraging Washington to change, that they must have same-day voter registration. That's never going to occur in the remaining caucus states unless we flip the government in those states. They will never agree to same-day registration. And, uh, and, and we're also saying same-day party registration, and, and we're also saying absentee voting. So it isn't just the total number of people that vote. It's what kind of people. What do they look like? What, are they working class? What, are, what happens to people uh, in those states in terms of voter registration when we turn it over to the Republican Party to run it? That's what we're trying to protect here. Thanks, Larry. Jan is next. Yeah, I totally agree with Larry. Um, we're talking about small rural states, uh, states with, with uh, our voter rights being eroded every day. Our Republican Secretary of State passed an, an aggressive voter ID bill. And, um, you know, frankly, the caucuses are our, our means to build the party in these small rural states. Um, to Emmy's point, Washington state is very blue and it's, it's a larger state and, and I, I understand. Um, uh, but for us, it's the party. It's the only way that we can build and grow our party and have an open and inclusive process. So um, I'm with Jane. Hands off, David. Okay, uh, next is Jeff Weaver. Yeah, so I have a couple of concerns with this amendment. Uh, first of all, I, I, I was under the impression this was sort of pre-negotiated, but um, so I, I have a concern on that level. But also, I mean, what's really problematic here is that, I mean, if people, if there are people on this commission who oppose caucuses who want to have an amendment, a vote on that, we can have that vote if that's really what their position is. But why we would turn over, essentially, the decision about whether the Democratic Party in a certain state has a caucus or primary to a Republican administration, right? Why we're turning over our party nominating process to Republican legislators and governors, uh, I think, is really uh, a bad move. Okay, next we have Emmy. And I see you in the back. Hi, just a few things. I think, Jan, really quick, Washington is a, it, it has an appearance of a blue state. Um, I think if we all spend a little bit more time there and got to know the legislature a little bit better, I think we would all be in agreement that it's one of those states that still has a lot of room for growth. Um, on caucuses, I would say, well, it's blue in appearance, but I mean, we have members from Washington State here who could also tell us a little bit more about it. Um, in terms of caucuses, I also want to say, like, of course, I see the benefits of caucuses. I was raised by caucuses in Nevada. I think I have seen them strengthen the Democratic Party there. Uh, I think that that is a big reason why uh, Jorge and others were so successful there last November. And so, you know, I, I see both sides of the coin, but I think I, I would like some clarification on the language. So as it stands right now, if Nebraska is a sole exception, then technically 
the way it's written right now, Iowa could still be impacted by a Republican primary. Not not your amendment, David, the way that it's written in the report. N no. Uh, uh, that was that Emmy was. Ruiz of Texas. So yeah. this is, so this is, so Jan, this is nothing new to Iowa because that's, it's already in there. No, is, they, is that, it, I don't know. It's five or more, so uh, oh. Iowa has uh, how many congressional districts? Four. four. So the Iowa four. would not, only right. So only with the amendment. Right, so, so to your question, in terms of how it's currently addressed, five was uh, the number to protect for the smaller states, which included Iowa and Nevada, which we're at four. Got it. If Iowa picks up a congressional district, then Iowa would have to do it again. That's true. Iowa's I'd originally proposed six for that reason, but I had originally proposed six for that reason, to protect Got it. Iowa. Got it. Okay. Thanks. That was my question. I, I we have a list here, and I but I just have a question for Jane, just as a point of clarification. In very practical terms, if this moves, this amendment moves forward, does Nebraska would you still have a caucus for the party building side, or would be, would you as a party not have it because it's not connected um, to delegate allocation numbers? I mean, anybody from the state of Nebraska would tell you this, that I don't make decisions as chair unilaterally. And so we have a very robust debate and discussion currently happening in the state of Nebraska. So I don't know if we are going to do a primary or a caucus. There are really good arguments on both sides within our state right now. We could have a primary. Um, we could have a caucus. But Jane Cleave of um, Nebraska. for me, Putting a restriction on this takes that right away as our state to have that discussion and debate. Discussion Mayor Webb. Amendment, um, amendment by David Hinn of Louisiana. Which I think it's a difficult issue, and although I love Larry, try to do away you, with caucuses. Right. Um, a lot of times, but not always. I, I think sometimes we have conflicting values, and one of the values we've always talked about is encouraging the use of primaries having as many people vote as possible. And for us to defend, if you have 22,000 people as opposed to 80,000 people voting, kind of runs against the grain on that, on, on, that, on that debate. The second part is that we all want to give Jane and Jan and all others from small states the opportunity to, 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 to administer the desire of the people in those states. But at the same time, we're also encouraging people in those states to go to a primary because we have more people voting. And you know, Jane and I have worked as co-chairs on caucuses. I think this may be the only time we've had some disagreement. But I think the overarching part is where we're gonna fall in the long term. And I think the long term issue is how do we get more people participating in the party? And we get more people participating in the party when we use, use primaries as opposed to caucuses. Okay, we have Jorge, Lucy, Yvette, Jan, Senator Turner. I think a, l a little bit on that point. So we spent the day yesterday, and I think someone, I, I can't remember who said we weren't here uh, trying to advocate for state rights or something. And yet uh, a lot of the stuff that we've done has mandated parties to do things and has, ma has really uh, put a burden on parties now because of things that we've come up with here. So we can't just, you know, pick and choose. I think ultimately, I think ultimately, um, it's, it's also my turn. Um, I think ultimately you have 20,000 people that participate or you have 80,000 people that participate. And if we're not doing a good job playing by the cards that we have, you know, frankly, the, unless we start getting big wins in Kansas, we're gonna have to learn how to play by these rules. We're gonna have to register these folks. We're gonna have to educate them on how to vote in the primary process and deal with these really bad voter suppression laws. That being said, I think if we get the, if we do that early, if we start helping people understand that there's one process, whether it's a primary, and we really start educating people early on that, instead of, well, you have to do a caucus, and then you have to vote in the primary, but then your vote doesn't count there for president, and it counts for all sorts of other things. I think that could be confusing. So streamlining it, making sure that we're educating folks on what the, what the rules are in that state so that we could effectively then change it when we come to power. But unless something happens in Kansas or in other, some of these other smaller states, that's not gonna happen. So if there's a good education program that we're focused on primaries early, I think that ultimately that's what we have to play by. 
Jorge Neri of Illinois. Lucy. Previous was Wellington Webb of Thank Colorado. You, Madam Chair. I, I just want to say after listening to all these comments that a couple things. One, um, you know, frankly, this isn't to me uh, ever a discussion about DNC versus state control, caucus versus primary, et cetera. I, I think that the discussion is always about what is going to, to work best moving forward. And frankly, I find all of the information and arguments very compelling around the future. And as a former legislator in Nevada, I can certainly attest to the incredible dysfunction that could be caucuses, but I can also attest to the really incredible party building that occurs around caucuses. We, even though held a Democratic majority in the legislature, were always governed by a Republican. Therefore, we could never get same-day registration. And the only way in which we could do that was via our caucus system. So there's pros and cons, et cetera. What I am most concerned about and why I cannot support this amendment is because moving forward 10, 15 years ago, none of us would have anticipated that we would have lost almost a supermajority of our legislatures in this country to Republican control. And I don't know what the future holds for us. Clearly, we are all trying to ensure that we get that back and that we can switch that over to democratic control of most of those legislatures. But until one of us figures out how to tell the future, I think that we have to be very concerned about these unintended consequences, particularly as it relates to legislative control and, and, and we just cannot assure that that's not going to happen. So therefore, um, I, I cannot support this amendment. Lucy Thank Flores you, of California. I, I have a question as someone that doesn't come from a caucus state, so I have no point of reference whatsoever. So this is for information purposes and I don't want the answer to be because that's the way it's been done or that's, the, that's what the people know or that's what we're comfortable with. So I wanna take that off of the table. But I do wanna ask, is there a way, because all I'm hearing is 22,000 votes counted, 80, 88,000 didn't. That's, and that's what's sticking out for me. That's the most, that's the only thing that I hear right now. And as someone who it has experienced through my history, voter suppression at the highest level, that always makes my skin rise. And so I don't want to be unfair and jump to the wrong conclusion. That's why I really need answers to these questions. So my, my main question is, is there anything that can be done to reconcile the disparity in the numbers? Mm -hmm. Is that something that can be looked at first to bring the 22,000, the 88,000 closer together without blowing up the system that you're comfortable with? And if we can't come up with that solution, then maybe we need to look at changing the system, but under no circumstances should that many votes be discounted ever as part of our democratic process. So if somebody can answer that for me, I would feel better. Yvette so I, I will, as a chair, answer this just quickly based on chair the other recommendations Jennifer we have in the caucus section that I think gets at some of this. So we are requiring absentee voting. So that's, I think, answer number one. We are requiring same-day voter registration and party affiliation changes at the location. Um, so I think that gets at number two. Um, you know, obviously there are, um, you know, a lot of other things at play here, but just in terms of the very specific recommendations before the commission, I just wanted to highlight that those are two areas that, regardless of where we end up on this, are already part of the recommendations that would increase participation in caucuses. Jan Bauer of Iowa is next. To your question, Yvette, in, uh, in Iowa, our turnout for caucuses, uh, the last one was 30% of all registered Dems turned out, and that's, you know, uh, what's a, a caucus uh, turnout, or excuse me, a primary turnout's like 19%, uh, and uh, our last caucus turnout, also surpassed the last two statewide primaries in terms of turnout. So uh, granted, you know, we get a lot of publicity, and so that certainly helps, and it grows our, our turnout. But uh, with, with the uh, provisions in the, the resolution, 
you know, we, we will see our numbers grow even more, so. Senator Turner and then Congresswoman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just to add to what Sister Flores said, you know, caucuses are communal. They do bring people together. And if we only look at it in the light of electorally what is in the best interest of the Democratic Party, I think we need to flip that and say that what is in the best interest of the people in those states is in the best interest of the Democratic Party, bringing people together. Now, I was with Representative Flores in Nevada. I don't come from a caucus state. And I did see horror, but I also saw people coming together, talking to their neighbors and their friends in ways that don't happen in the primary process. And so the, the, the revisions or the compliments that we're making to try to make the caucus pr process fairer, because right, people are there all day. They do stand in long lines, but we're trying to correct that. But I don't think it is fair to the caucus states to take this away. And I also don't think that it is right to say to our sisters and brothers in smaller states and in rural communities that you don't really count because that has been the pattern of the Democratic Party. We should not leave them behind. And in terms of voter suppression, and it is correct that most of the voter suppression bills that have been passed throughout this country since the election of President Obama have been vicious and vile at the hands of the GOP. But at the same time, Democrats don't have clean hands in states like New York. So if we want to talk about voter suppression, we need to talk about it across the board. But I agree with Chairwoman Kleb. I agree with Jan that we need to allow the caucus process to work, to clean up that process and be cognizant that it is not perfect. But we cannot only look at the caucus as pure votes, we need to look at the caucus process in terms of how it brings communities together in ways that don't happen in the primary process because you just come in to vote. Where during the caucuses, people get a chance to talk to their neighbors and hopefully maybe want to join the Democratic Party and to help the party build. So there is a value to the caucus process. Okay, we have Congresswoman Fudge next. Okay. We vote on calling the question. So we need a two-thirds vote to call the question. All those in favor of calling the question, please raise your hands. All those opposed to calling the question? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, pass. I'd move to table the amendment. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to table the amendment. All those in favor of tabling the amendment, please raise your hands. Jeff Weaver is moved to table. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, wait, I. Seven, eight, no, eight, nine. Wait, keep them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Okay. Nine for tabling. So, do we have to do opposed? How many? Those who are opposed to tabling, please raise your hands. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's Twenty votes total. So. I vote to table. So the chairs are breaking the tie to table the amendment. Okay. Do we have any oh, addition? Record. What? So we table. When does it? When does it come back? This is our last meeting. Only with the majority. Or he near you? So and we can. We as a commission, we have all day that we can go. So we can come back and um, and. Since it's know, the last meeting, when will it come back? Work through that as well. They need to get a majority yes, of votes to Jim bring back. Zogby. I, I, um, James Zogby of Washington. I understand that we have we, we may have to work on this, but I, I I do want to make a point about this issue going to the Rules and Bylaws Committee, because um, as I noted the vote around the table, those who voted to not table, many of them are going to be members of the Rules and Bylaws Committee. Closer to the mic. I'm sorry, I just can't hear you. And most of those who voted to table are not members of the Rules and Bylaws Committee. And therefore, there's a question here of equity when it comes before the Rules and Bylaws Committee as to whether or not those who actually voted on this issue ought to be 
ask to recuse themselves from any consideration of this as it comes to the Rules and Bylaws Committee. Okay. Okay. Do we have any additional amendments to the caucus section? Can I, can, can I ask Jim to comment on that? Uh, Madam Chair. So I was just going to say later in the meeting, I'm going to speak to the process in the Rules and Bylaws Committee and how we will hope to hear from uh, the various points of view at this commission, at the Rules and Bylaws uh, Committee. Uh, and I will say that uh, rules with respect to caucuses are a, a core Rules and Bylaws Committee issue. Uh, so one way or another, it will come to the Rules and Bylaws Committee. James I, Roosevelt, I know that it will, but the question of whether or not you can have a fair vote on the Rules and Bylaws Committee when people on one side of that issue are voting on it here and people on the other side of this issue are not present on the Rules and Bylaws Committee. And yes, we can have a, we can go and, and speak to it, but there's a kind of double dipping going on here that I think is, is, is important to deal with. And therefore, I would ask for a recommendation that people recuse themselves from consideration of issues that have come before this body when it comes before the Rules and Bylaws Committee. And I feel, I feel that that's a, a, a critical concern. So I, I just want, I appreciate your remarks here on this. This is uh, uh, the focus of what we're talking about right, right now is caucuses, and that is not a recommendation that has been brought up previously in terms of the draft that we're going through and in specific to recommendations on caucuses. So what I'd like to do is move to voting on caucuses unless there is any other amendments we're going to bring forth for the caucus section. Can I just respond to your statement just there? Our commission started before the current Rules and Bylaws Committee was appointed, so we weren't able to put that on the table or have any say in that. The current Rules and Bylaws Committee was appointed but a month and a half ago. Appreciate that, but we are focused at this moment on the caucuses, and I want to bring to a vote on the caucuses and stay in order with the protocol we have here on this section. So what we, unless there are any other amendments, then we are going to move to a vote. And I am going to read. We are going to vote section by section. As a reminder, we have tabled number three here. Uh, so we will not be voting on that, but we will vote uh, one by one on the rest. So I will go through I, as we did yesterday. This, the protocol that we have used for every other standard is we table both. We table the amendment and we table the recommendation. Okay. Okay. So I will read through and then we will come back and we will vote on each section. Okay. So the commission uh, is making the following recommendations. Number one, a caucus state delegate selection plan for a presidential nominating caucus shall only be approved if it A, requires absentee voting, B, demonstrates that the submitting state party has the financial and technical ability to successfully run the caucus, C, requires same-day voter registration and party affiliation changes at the caucus location, D, the amended version requires the public reporting of the total statewide vote counts for each candidate based on the first expression of preference by caucus participants. <coughs> e requires votes for the presidential nominating process to be cast in writing and a method to be determined in each plan to ensure an accurate recount or recanvas is available. One model option could be the adoption of the Firehouse Caucus. F includes the standard and procedure by which a recount or recanvas can be requested by a presidential candidate and carried out in a timely manner. G, locks the allocation of all national delegates based on the initial round of voting. Recommendation number two. Oh wait, did, did we, yeah. All right, you're, I forgot my own protocol here. Yeah, I, I, uh, I would like to move that we vote as a block for number one. Second. Okay. All those in favor of recommendation number one, please raise your hand. You, uh, with, an, an abstain, with an abstention. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Number one passes. 
Number two, uh, state delegate selection plan for presidential nominating caucus must include a narrative of the specific actions a state party is taking to limit the impact of any voter suppression or disenfranchisement being imposed on the electoral process by the state. All those in favor of number two, please raise your hands. Uh, one <coughs> abstention, same. Okay, number two passes. We got you. But we'll keep having you say that so you're on the record. <coughs> Okay, number three is tabled. Number four, the commission further recommends that the DNC institute a national training program and convening that provides best practices, guidance on selecting accessible caucus locations, ideas on making caucuses a positive and inclusive experience for voters, and outlines rules the DNC has provided to ensure that caucuses are open and transparent. All those in favor, please raise your hands. Looks like we have, what's the total number without no. Jim? No, we have an abstention. Yeah, I think we have an 18 something. Okay. Yeah. It was 18. 18, okay. <coughs> Jim? 17, I'm sorry. Gotcha. 17. Yep. Thought it was <laughs> Which way do you want it? <laughs> All right, right. number five. <laughs> the commission recommends that the DNC work with state parties to create consistent standards and guidelines across all caucuses that allow for the implementation of best practices for information dissemination and reporting of votes. The DNC should also explore technology resources available to support state parties in creating a tracking and reporting system that states can use to streamline the registration and reporting process. All those in favor of recommendation five, please raise your hands. We are unanimous with one abstention, Jim Roosevelt, for the record. Number six, finally, the commission recommends that the appropriate steps be taken to ensure caucus voters, like those in primary states, have a right to participate in the caucus process. These steps should include any required rule changes and the proper education and outreach to ensure the right to caucus is enshrined in our process at every level. All those in favor of recommendation number six, please raise your hands. It is unanimous with one abstention. Jim Roosevelt. Okay, with that, we are through the caucus section, and we are going to move immediately to Madam the, Chair. Yes. Uh, before we move, I want to take this opportunity to uh, Thank the outstanding work done by the co-chair of the uh, caucus section, Jan Cleve, uh, an outstanding chairwoman from Nebraska. Um, I would say that uh, we reached agreement on all of our issues except the last one. And, uh, and uh, I just want to take this opportunity to, for the general public to also see that we are able to work together as a team, that we had both Clinton and Sanders people on the team and that uh, we agreed on probably 19 out of 20 issues for the party thank to you. move forward. Well said, thank you. Okay, we ready? We are now going to move to um, the amendments that were tabled yesterday, and we will go through those. And so we are gonna, we are gonna bring them up um, one by one, and we will have I think C-SPAN had one of their lights kind of explode. So Chairwoman Jennifer O'Malley Dillon is, she forgot to put her mic on, but she's saying they're taking a they're going to take a 10 minute recess and figure out what happened there because it's not that she forgot to turn on her mic. She, uh, I think all the mics just went off when that uh, light exploded. All right, so we're going to take a break. Um, where are we webcasting? Facebook.com slash 
The Young Turks, and YouTube.com slash TYT Politics. Eric Byler here. Thanks for watching. Uh, we will come back when they are back in maybe 10 minutes, but probably longer. Uh, thanks very much. I'll give you a little C-SPAN. Wide view of a room where they're not in session in the meantime. Hold on. <laughs>